Hey everyone, today we are here with Brian Finn, uh, Portfolio Manager of Finn Capital based in New York. Um, and today we wanted to talk about um, uh, a company that is a, is a deep value play, but also has uh, potentially some, some meme stock potential. So uh, um, Brian, we're, we're excited to have you on. Um, just really quickly, uh, tell us about just quick background on yourself, how you ended up, um, you know, managing money professionally. Uh, and then we can, we can start talking a little bit more about ODP and some of the stuff you're working on. Sure. So I was, um, you know, I started my career at, uh, at Deutsche Bank trading mortgage derivatives and I went to business school and then I was at, uh, Glencore, which is a, a Swiss commodity trading firm for a couple of years. And then I had a fund called force capital and then a fund called Matt capital. And then I launched, uh, I launched FIN uh, two years ago and, you know, we've been uh, sort of finding little small cap idiosyncratic opportunities and, and uh, you know, building a business here. So, yeah, no, um, it's, it's been incredible to watch your, uh, your fund grow. I think Finn Capital is now advising on something like $70 million in, in assets, um, uh, which has been pretty impressive over such a short lifespan. Um, your your overall strategy is it's, it's pretty value oriented, right? But I mean, how would you describe your, your general strategy and approach to investing? You know, the strategy is is to try to find situations where there's been uh, you know call it a technical factor or behavioral factor that's, that's driven a dislocation. So you know, a technical factor could be a stock's been delisted or has faced litigation or you know some sort of extrinsic event that causes investors to just unilaterally sell it off. A behavioral yeah. factor could be, you know, just the different behavioral biases people have, like hurting, uh, uh, you know, recency bias. There's a whole litany of biases that, that people um, have as individuals and, you know, also have as investors that can cause a stock to become extremely dislocated. Yeah. So, you know, our, our, our process is to, to, to try to find situations where, you know, there's a pattern of technical or behavioral uh, factors that have driven a dislocation and then to just apply a real extensive diligence process to that uh, situation to figure out if that, uh, you know, there's some sort of valuation asymmetry that's been created, um, you know, where uh, the actual intrinsic or fundamental value is, is sharply deviated from where the, the stock is currently trading. Yeah. And when you, when you can find that and, and prove it out, then you have potentially a skewed risk reward. And then the next step is to figure out what the catalyst schedule is for, that skewed risk reward being realized, you know, but the so, goal is to find, yeah. to find situations where, you know, you're not, you're not betting on a, on a market rising or falling. Um, you're betting on idiosyncratic risk factors related to, you know, one, one company. Or, so, you know, at some zero, we love these sort of off the radar situations that are not necessarily being talked about um, in the media or on Reddit or, you know, some of the more, um, sort of some of the more, more popular kind of, kind of venues, but, like, how did ODP hit your screen? I mean, what was the initial um, spark that got you interested uh, in, in the story? And I'm just just curious how you first heard about it. Um, you know, I had a close a close friend of mine who'd been following the story closely. Um, had kind of noticed a couple of, of transformational changes that had occurred, a couple of recent hires that they'd made um, um, from Amazon. And I had a, a, a cousin who'd worked at Amazon and, and just started diligent, dilig uh, you know, calling people through that network to figure out sort of what was happening there. Um, you know, but it was, it was seeing a couple of changes that had taken place, uh, you know, with, with their personnel and with how they were, you know, reorienting a, a company that at least on the surface seemed like it was a, a failing retailer, um, you know, into something that's, that's going to be radically different i think in a, in a couple of years so, so like most people know odp as office depot um what is their footprint just as far as retail goes in terms of just number of stores where they're located where they have concentration um so here i'll, I'll give you the, the bigger background here so odp you know they've got three businesses they've got CompuCon, which was an it services business they bought a couple of years ago uh when when uh, the ceo jerry first came into into his office, uh, and they've got the retail stores. They've got a couple hundred retail stores spread out throughout the uh, throughout the country, uh, and then they have this business solutions business, um, which is basically 
a B2B business where they're selling directly to businesses. Uh, and that's a, you know, essentially a distribution logistics business. Um, so, you know, the, the, the story with ODP was, you know, they bought CompuCom um, and that turned out to be kind of a disaster. And so mm -hmm. they were struggling with that acquisition, uh, you know, from 20, I believe it was 2016 when, when they bought it. So the last couple of years dealing with basically a failed acquisition there. And the retail business, you know, was, was declining like a lot of other brick and mortar retailers. So, you know, this is a business that, uh, you know, it's been lampooned on Family Guy, uh, Office Depot for being, you know, you go into an Office Depot and it's like, it's a wasteland and, you know, no one's there buying stuff. Uh, yeah. You know, as, uh, as most people, you know, sort of migrated to, uh, to making a lot of those purchases online. So, you know, it seemed like a, a melting ice cube. But what's happened here is... Uh, the companies finally figured out and made this, this decision to really pivot away from, you know, both CompuCom and the retail business towards this, this business solutions division, which actually has, you know, a ton of potential going forward um, that I can kind of get into. Yeah. Can you just, what is the size of that logistics business? Um, and <clears throat> just walk us through that. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll give you kind of the rough, you know, the, the way the way I think you should look at ODP now, um, and to bring you fully up to date to what's happened here is is they're uh, they're looking to sell off CompuCom, um, and they're looking uh, and they and they have a bid now for their retail business, so they're gonna uh, get rid of these two divisions and focus entirely on business solutions, which which does you know. Last year, it did roughly five billion in revenue, um, but the sum of the parts math here is they've got a bid right now from Staples or Sycamore, which runs uh, owns Staples, uh, for roughly a billion dollars for the retail business. They'll probably sell CompuCon for between two hundred to three hundred million. They've got net cash of roughly four hundred million. They'll generate cash this this current quarter. Um, you add all that up and you get to, you know, roughly, you know, $30 in the low end of cash that they could easily have on their balance sheet, you know, within a couple of months, if all these deals go through, you know, it could end up being more obviously if, uh, if, uh, if they hold out for a higher, a higher valuation from, from Staples. Um, and then that leaves them with this, this business solutions business, which has, you know, call it roughly five billion in revenue um, right now, uh, and you know, some of that revenue, uh, once it's it's fully split off from retail, will will go away and call it you know a billion dollars worth of that. So maybe it's it's four billion fully uh, on its own, but that should start to organically grow, and I can kind of get into to what's happening there um, and why that will start to organically grow. Um, but if that if that begins to organically grow and starts to generate, you know, real real EBIT margins here again, you can get a business that's doing, you know, call it 250 to maybe 300 million in, in operating profit, um, and you're basically, you know, you're valuing that at, at essentially nothing. Um, you know, right now, ODP, uh, you know, if you were to assume kind of like my, my middle valuation for what they can get for the rest of their businesses, it's roughly $35. ODP is trading for, for 47. Uh, and these guys could do, you know, 300 million, so maybe $6 in, in, in EBIT. So you're paying, you know, $12 for $6 in EBIT uh, going forward. And that EBIT arguably should trade at a much, much higher multiple if you start to comp it to the sort of multiples that other, uh, you know, distribution businesses get and, you know, Which platform. Is what, what is the typical logistics business multiple if you're looking at it on an EBIT basis? Well, like Fastenal and, and Granger will trade, you know, between like Fastenal trades at like close to 25 times, 25, to 25 times, uh, you know, next 12 months uh, EBIT. Uh, you know, Granger is, you know, 15 times. Um, 
So those types of industrial uh, distribution businesses end up, you know, with, with very high multiples because they have very sort of sticky customer bases and can kind of grow every year. So, you know, the real, I guess the real, uh, the, the, the crux of the story here really is, is how they can transform this BSD division and how they can cause it to grow. Because the knock on these guys before was that they were selling, you know, they were selling products that were basically on their way to, to not, uh, you know, not really being in existence, like printers and, and toners and paper and stuff like that. You know, we're obviously heading towards a, a world where less of those products are gonna be consumed. But what they can do is they can add a bunch of other verticals here because they already have sort of the, the different touch points with the, with the end market consumers here. They already have the relationships with the different offices that are buying supplies and schools. And, and what they can do, which Amazon can't do, and the reason why I think uh, the folks who joined from Amazon, so they, they got this guy, Terry Lieber and, and Michael Prentice, who were essentially the guys that built out Amazon business and turned it from a sort of a nothing, a, a nothing vertical to a, you know, over $10 billion in annualized revenue. Um, the reason why I think they're excited here is because when you look at Amazon, I mean, Amazon basically, you know, it's, it's sort of a patchwork delivery system. Um, it wasn't designed, uh, you know, with, with large businesses in mind, it was designed with, with consumers in mind. So if you were a large business and you wanted to order a bunch of paper from Amazon, they'll, they'll send you the paper, but it'll come in a bunch of different boxes over the course of a couple of days or however long it takes. And that, that'd be true for any of these business products that you know, businesses have to consume or office products. ODP on the other hand, they have a whole logistics system and a, and a white glove delivery service and they can get you a pallet of whatever that product is inside your office and they can even set it up for you if you need that to occur. And that can all happen you know, literally within a day. So it's a totally different kind of distribution platform than what um, Amazon is capable of. Now, over the last year or so, uh, you know, they've been making this, this pivot. You know, they hired these guys, uh, they hired Prentice in February of this, this current year, they hired uh, Leaper the prior year. Um, you know, so they're in the process of making this pivot. And what they're also looking to do is turn this into a, a platform where, you know, if you're a third party, you can, you can sell your, your goods on it. So it can become sort of a, uh, uh, you know, a middleman between, you know, folks who have various office products to sell or other, you know, they're going to get into other verticals like MRO and medical supplies. They got into P, uh, PPE, which was a, you know, nothing vertical that they turned into several hundred million over, overnight. Um, now this, this whole transformation has been obscured by the fact that, you know, we've, we've, had everything locked down over the last year or so. So businesses haven't been open. They haven't needed to go buy any of these office products. Schools haven't been open. Now that's all about to really massively change, you know, in a couple of months. And there was an article out on Bloomberg a couple of days ago talking about how this, this next sort of back to school buying season is gonna be maybe the biggest ever or by far the biggest ever. It's going to be, you know, twenty percent more than what it was in twenty nineteen. Uh, offices are going to have to rip back open to some degree. Um, now, you'll probably still see people working at home, um, but you might have a hybrid work environment, so people might have to order stuff for both a home office and a and a work office. So you could see just a big boost in structural structural demand here going forward after a year and a half of, of not really having any structural demand in conjunction with having added these other verticals um, that they're, they're looking to add and in conjunction with having turned this, this distribution platform into a, a third party marketplace. So would, so, would, 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 would uh, Office Deep or ODP business uh, solutions or their distribution segment, could that be something Amazon would leverage or like, could they be a customer of Amazon? No, I mean, it'd be something, it'd be something that if you're, I don't know, you make staplers or you make, you make masks or you make, I don't know, think of your random, I mean, there's all sorts of random things that businesses need that we don't think about. You need janitorial supplies or you need to restock your, 
your break room, um, you know, and you're a company that sells those products, you could use these guys, uh, you could use their platform to sell these products and they could, um, you know, the customer could be, uh, <clears throat> you know, the end office customer could be buying these products through the ODP platform. Um, and ODP, you know, does all the fulfillment, et cetera. So ODP would act as a, as, as a middleman in that, in that case. Um, so I think that's, that's the direction these guys will, will, will take this, this business. You know, Amazon's problematic for, for, you know, in a couple of ways, you know, in one way, because, uh, you know, they can't deliver all these products at once into your office, et cetera, as I mentioned, but they're also problematic because they end up white labeling a lot of your own products. So if you have a product that's doing really well, then Amazon, you know, essentially will, will steal it and start selling it themselves. Um, you know, there've been different lawsuits about that recently. So I think if you're, if you're a supplier, you know, it makes sense to want to have other, other ways to get your product to your customers. And if ODP can, can really make this pivot to being a, a distributor, then, you know, they, they can be a, a long-term solution for you, you know, let's, and that's, let's, yeah, let's talk about, I'm just curious about the management team and, and, um, the, 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 the activists involved in the name, cause I know, uh, H.G. Boras, which is one of the investors, but, but can you just speak to kind of what their uh, maybe execution track record is and, and um, how aggressive they're, they're being in this transformation and just where we are, and, you know, like how close are they to inflecting that part of the business, which they plan on retaining? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, what was, I mean, it's great to have have that fund involved here because I think they they get all this um you know I think their my initial sense was was they were pushing more for these guys to lever their cash and do a, a Dutch tender which and they are the company is buying back shares um but I guess I'll speak I'll speak to a few things so so you know th this transformation uh, you know I think was 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 that was 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 gaining ground if you will towards the end of last year um, and they were all set to do a big investor day to speak to a lot of this, I think. And then they got this bid from, from Sycamore. Um, you know, the initial bid was $40 for the whole thing. And, you know, I think they pushed back on both the valuation and the ability for that bid to go through and survive, you know, uh, the FTC. Um, so, uh, you know, they pushed back doing an investor day and kind of telling this whole transformation. Now that that bid has been revised to just uh, just the retail portion, which I think is good because you know I think ODP is should be okay with 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 selling that. Now that said, you know that retail business should do pretty well during this whole back to school, uh, back to work sort of structural demand boost that's about to occur, occur in the next uh, couple of months. So I could see ODP maybe being hesitant to just get rid of it right here and. You know, maybe maybe these negotiations take a little bit longer to to really play out, but uh, you know their desire to really tell the story here, um, I think is is a bit muted uh, because you know one they're trying to arrange a couple of these transactions and two you know they they've stated that their their intention is to start buying back shares, so you know if you're if you're HG Vora if you're the the funds involved in this you know you don't you care about where this thing's marked by the end of this year. Your incentive is to see uh, these guys buy back as much of their, their float as they possibly can at as low a price as possible, and then maybe fully go out there and, and, and tell the story and, and show that ODP is, has massively transformed itself. And you're gonna have all the structural tailwinds that uh, you know, will be there in Q3 and Q4. Mm -hmm. So I could see I could see the world really figuring this out after they report um, Q3 maybe. Uh, What's the size of that stock buyback? Uh, it's a couple hundred million at the moment. You know, it, there were there were folks who were talking about you know these guys should should sell their headquarters and and um, you know lever up and buy back even more shares. You know, the, the buyback, I think the buyback and all the cash that they have sort of gives you a floor here, but where this becomes, you know, a real 
a real huge win is if they if they really make this uh, this this transformation work and they really shed the the reputation of being sort of a dead brick and mortar company and become sort of an innovative distributor, you know, with a real digital presence and the ability to do third party market sales. And you, you think that distribution business is is that worth sixty bucks a share? Could that be worth more than that? I mean, if you take yeah, out I mean, it just it just depends on yeah. You I mean, I, you know, I modeled it um, at you know being worth uh, you know between fifty and 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 eighty, ninety. I mean, it just depends on whatever multiple you want to apply here. Um, but I think you know the the, the street. Uh, and the world needs to see organic growth there again and yeah. needs to see these guys actually showing that they can add new verticals um, and they have a, a compelling product that um, can compete with Amazon um, and do well, you know, split off from the retail business. I think one concern here is, you know, how, how interwoven is this business with the retail business um, and having done uh an expert call on that, I think with, with the former head of it, you know, he, uh, <clears throat> I think that the, the suggestion here at the moment is that, that it's, it's not that interwoven and that they can be split effectively. Mm -hmm. um, so I think to the degree that, that this, this transaction maybe takes a while to, to, to occur, you know, it's probably haggling over price, um, you know, and, and, and those sorts of issues versus I think you know, an operational, um, you know, can they actually do it? You mentioned that Staples had put a bid on the business, uh, which was rejected. Was that in addition to the Sycamore bid? And, and how is it, was it lower? Sorry, than so, 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 so Staples or, and Sycamore are the same thing. They're the same thing, okay. Yeah, so uh, Sycamore is a private equity fund that owns Staples. Oh, okay, got it. Got so, it. So Sycamore is actually the entity that's that's putting forth the bid um, as the owner of Staples, and I think you know they're incentivized to obviously want, you know, right now ODP doesn't trade at a very particularly high multiple here, and uh, if you're looking to eventually go public with with uh, <coughs> with with Staples again and IPO it, you don't want some company out there trading with a really low multiple that's you know basically your same business. This is the third time they've they've done this, try to do this deal. Um, so I don't think you make three attempts and fail each each time. I think you, you know, the third time you you figure it out. So I think, I think they're incentivized to to want to get something done. I think you know ODP should should be okay too with with uh, selling off their retail business because it's not core to what they're trying to do here. Um, this is really about having, you know a new focus with the right leadership, you know, on a business that could organically grow in the future if, if run the right way and levered the right way and, you know, with the right uh, people in charge. Is it, what's the timeline on the, the Sycamore deal? Do you, do you think that's something that does get done uh, in the third quarter or do you think it's uh, maybe further out? Um, yeah, I would think that if that happens, and again, it cannot happen. And I, I don't think that, you know, the, the stock would probably obviously trade trade down for a bit if it doesn't happen, but then the, the companies can go out, go out and buy back more stock. <laughs> so it's not, it's not like this needs to happen for the, the story to work, but I think um, I think it should still likely happen. And if it does happen, it's probably, you know, in the near term, the stock pops on that. But I think, you know, you're talking sometime this quarter um, would be my guess, but that's just a, uh, a guess of sorts. Yeah, I don't think I don't think this drags out for you know, you know, more than a year, and the the bid was put in, you know, basically six months ago. At least the the, the very first bid. Yeah, and your your point is that you don't think the company is like wants to tell its story right now, I, right? It sounds like they're they're happy to sort of keep it on the DL while they buy back more shares and maybe they finish this negotiation with Sycamore. Um, so have they, they've been pretty quiet. I mean, what's the sell side coverage look like on this name these days? Like what's I mean, the sell it's, side? It's, it's pretty limited. I mean, I don't think there's, there's a lot of sell side, uh, uh, you know, you know, 
you've got uh, JP Morgan, Sedoti, and that's basically it. You know, I think the Sedoti guy sort of gets it um, and has been speaking to this transformation a bit, but, you know, it's not, it, it's just not going to be fully evident until they, uh, until some of these, these headwinds reverse, you know, until offices and schools reopen. Um, and they don't really need to tell the story right now. They can, they can kind of wait and yeah. buy back shares and they can finish these transactions and then they can go out and they can really show how they, they've are in the process of taking a, a business that seemed like it was dying and turning it into a growing business again by changing the way they- Sounds like the perfect sum zero uh, idea <laughs> in some respects. Um, so um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, risks related to the thesis, what would you say are the, you know, the primary risks that, that worry you about, about the name? Well, I mean, I think there's kind of like, there's a mark to market risk in any stock, you know, like if, if they came out tomorrow and said, um, Hey, Sycamore is walking away then the stock probably trades down. But, uh, you know, if, if, if you believe in the transformation, you know, then I think, uh, there's still risks, obviously, in, in the execution of it. Um, you know, one risk, obviously, is that while they're able to get these other verticals, maybe their their core verticals, like I mentioned earlier, the sort of call it like Dunder, you know, the, the Dunder Mifflin type businesses like paper and and toner, you know, businesses that are obviously going to die over time, uh, that those those erode faster than you know than they anticipate. Um, you know, it could be that the demand for office, for things in the office is just much more structurally lower going forward. And that the folks who stay at home just order stuff on Amazon. Now, I think there's a reason why, you know, procurement officers at companies would want to see uh, people's, you know, how they, how they buy things start to get centralized more again and not have to go deal with a million receipts and just be working with one vendor. So I think, I think I do think a lot of uh, you know what people buy for their home office will start to be done you know with you know more in conjunction with how their uh, their regular office is run. What do you um, think about um, what do you think of, like the this, this stock has in terms of um, social media potential? I mean, when does um, I mean it seems to have a lot of the ingredients of you know what a lot of the Reddit type folks care about in terms of being, you know, there's a brick and mortar story here. Um, you know, it's not really loved by Wall Street so much, or the sell side so much. Um, you know, there's kind of an underdog story here just by virtue of it being a, a there being a transformation involved. Um, but like, it doesn't at the same time seem to have much in the way of social media traction. Do, do, you, do you have any intel on that or any color on, um, where there might be chatter on the name um, to change sentiment a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, OEP is not, you know, people have heard of GameStop obviously because they people play video games and they've heard of AMC because they go to movie theaters. You know, you've, you've heard of Office Depot, but they, they changed their name to ODP to reflect the fact that they're in a holding structure now and that, you know, Office Depot is now just kind of one part of the business. Um, so ODP doesn't really have any, any particular name recognition here. You know, there is some some short interest in this. Uh, you know, last time I checked, it was maybe, you know, eight to 10% of the float. So there is, you know, there are guys out there that are shorting this, viewing this as a dying brick and mortar retailer. Um, but I think, you know, it has it has some meme stock potential in the sense that like, you know, this is this is a business people think are, you know, is dying and, and you could argue that it's not. Um, you know, and that there's real valuation here. Um, you know, there's not, it doesn't have an unbelievable amount of short interest. Um, so it's hard to see, you know, a squeeze lasting forever, but. So you, you are the, the social media champion of ODP. I guess, you know, yeah. for, for now, <laughs> at least on, 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 on your platform on some zero. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny you mentioned GameStop because GameStop was, uh, you know, just as a um, this is fun factoid, but GameStop was written about on Sum Zero extensively a year before, uh, 
you know, the, the, the short squeeze happened pre-coronavirus. And um, in fact, the most recent GameStop report was written when the stock was trading at under $4 a share. Um, you know, now, of course, you would have like 50 x your, you know, your investment if, had you had you read that piece and bought in. Um, with this name, you know, I wonder, uh, you know, you mentioned kind of like at a minimum, this thing is trading at like two times EBIT. If you look at that distribution business um, as like a standalone, um, what would you say if you look at the bull scenario, um, what could happen here? Could, could this be a three bagger, four bagger? Like where, where's sort of the upper end of return potential on the stock if, if they do successfully execute on the, trans, on the, on the transformation, plus they, they consummate the, the sale with Sycamore um, and sell off some of their non-core assets. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, if, if, if you hit the high end of the, the cash number that I have, you know, that gets you closer to $40 a share. Um, and, you know, if they can do $6 a share and, 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 uh, operating profit in their, their BSD business, you know, in a, in a year or two from now, as that starts to kind of grow again and they, um, they focus on it, you know, that, that could, so 40 plus six times and you pick your number, uh, you know, it could be 20. Um, so that could get you to, you know, over 150 pretty pretty quickly. Um, plus, you know, they'd, well, they'd be buying back stock, so the float would be lower. Right. Uh, so, you know, you could have shorts you need to cover, company buying back stock, and then everyone else figuring out that these guys can actually grow their, their, their B2B business again um, in a world where things are opening up. And there's just, there's going to be like just a ton of structural demand, at least in Q3 um, and Q4, uh, you know, as, as people do go back to school and, and, you know, it just, it'll be a problem of like, how quickly can you get the stuff in, in the store and, and, or how quickly can you distribute it? Um, Love it. Um, so just uh, moving on to uh, one other name, just, this is a little bit of a quick bonus for folks who are listening, but um, tell us about offshore drilling and just your thoughts on that sector um, just for a little bit. We'd love to hear your, your thoughts there. Yeah, so I'll pull up my, um, my report here. Uh, I mean, you know, basically I think the way I look at the market right now is, you know, you can make money uh, finding these idiosyncratic ideas that have, you know, very idiosyncratic risk rewards uh, and risk factors that you diligence. And you can also make money finding sectors, um, you know, that really haven't re-rated yet and haven't come back. Um, a lot of things have obviously, um, but offshore oil, offshore drilling, you know, is one area that's just been decimated. Um, you go back to like 2007 and you had several hundred billion dollars in enterprise value that these offshore drillers, you know, made up. And today it's like, you know, basically not, I mean, the equity of pretty much every single one has been wiped out except for rig. Um, and a whole slew of them have just been reorganized over the last, you know, six months or so. Um, the problem with offshore drilling is that it's, it just takes a long time to, you know, you have to be confident in the long-term price of oil and, you know, shale is just so much quicker and, you know, shale wells can get up and running much more quicker and they deplete much more quicker. And so there's been, a, uh, you know, a lot of the CapEx dollars have shifted to shale, but I think, you know, we're going to see that start to reverse uh, and people are going to look for more offshore drilling projects because, you know, both the long-term price of oil has, has risen and, you know, we're going to see more drilling and, in, in, uh, you know, particularly like in the, the, the Arabian Gulf for things like natural gas um, and offshore Australia. So there's a lot of structural demand that's been, um, that's about to kind of come back. And you've got, uh, you know, last year, the, the CapEx dollars that have gone to, to you know, uh, oil field services in general has been you know, at a generational low and that has to, to, to mean revert a bunch and, and offshore is, you know, is, is 
also the most energy efficient way of, of uh, and the most environmentally friendly way of, of, of drilling for oil. You know, it's much more environmentally friendly than, you know, oil sands in Canada and uh, heavier oil in Venezuela and places like that. Um, so I, yeah, your, I mean, you, you'd written about uh, Valera Sun, Sun Zero. Um, is, is that your favorite name in the space? What's your, um, what's your take on how to best play it? Yeah, I mean, I like Valeris just because it's it's got it's got no debt, um, it has net cash, it has one of the biggest, you know, you know arguably the biggest fleet. Um, it's trading for the cheapest valuation. Um, was just recently reorganized. You know, the knock on Valeris is just they don't have a lot of contracts. A lot of so a lot of their uh, their rigs, you know, need to be taken out of cold stack and reactivated and get new contracts. But if you think that the market's tight and demand for these rigs is going to resume, then arguably not having a lot of contracted uh, rigs could be considered a good thing. So uh, there's not a lot of near-term cash, cash flow visibility, but if you look out a couple of years and you assume they bring back a lot of these rigs and that the day rates, which have been you know very low, start to improve, then they're generating just a ton of cash. And this has just been a business that's burned people for the last 10 you know, 20 years yeah. really. So there's not a lot of, so there's not a lot of folks who want to, you know, own these stocks. Uh, and this was a company that, you know, when it uh, went back uh, and was reorganized, you know, people expected it to trade between like a 1.8 and $3 billion EV. And it's, it's, it's well below that, that high end of that that initial estimate of the EV, even though oil prices are are much higher than you know when it uh, went public. Cool. Well, listen, we're gonna we're gonna follow um, Valeris for sure on on uh, you know, over the next coming months and years. And um, but ODP, I think, being kind of like a you know call it a six month uh, time frame idea, it's it's quite interesting because just given the number of catalysts that. Uh, you know they've got working in their favor school reopenings uh the 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 sycamore bid um and then sort of the longer term thesis uh centered on that that transformation of their distribution so it definitely seems like there's a lot of ways they can they can kind of win um brian thanks again for uh taking the time and, and chatting with us it's been great um and uh looking forward to following the story as it progresses cool thank you guys All right.